Hello, everyone. Hi. I am excited and delighted uh, to be speaking with, a, I want to say an old friend, <laughs> or maybe maybe um, maybe uh, someone who I've known since for a very long time, who's a young man, still is, and um, who I think is a very, very talented creator. Um, King Kamal, lovely to be speaking with you. What's up, Welcome. Man? And that's what's up, my man. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. You um, have made a, a, a film uh, called We Went Out that um, I watched that you sent me and then had to prompt me to make sure that I watched it. Um, and I actually set out that morning and went to this location that was nearby, sat on a park bench where I go often, and I pulled it up and I watched it. And I bawled <laughs> probably within like the first seconds of the mm -hmm. film. And I had, I think I sat there for about an hour and a half. I even started writing you a note and and I couldn't send it because I didn't know what I was saying yet. And um, I had not been so emotionally moved by a piece of cinema, short, long form, medium form, as much as I had been by watching that piece. And, and I was really like, went to this place of, of uh, the emotional connection and, and, the, and the storytelling. And I would love for you to just maybe talk about you know how you approach storytelling and how that's actually the work you've done to understand what that means mm. before you kind of delved into making a film yeah um i love i love i love storytelling i love it um, i love it in all its various aspects i you know i come from doing music and poetry. My father is a writer. My parents are filmmakers. Um, I'm an artist. I'm a graphic designer. Um, I'm other kinds of a designer. I, I, I just, I love making things and I love um, engaging with other things that people have made. Mm. And so, and I find the art of storytelling fascinating. I think it, it's core to us as human beings from I was going to say from the birth of language, but I think it's actually before the birth of language. Um, and, I, and I love language. And so, you know, uh, the, the opportunity to, the opportunity to tell a story that is fundamentally about some of my best friends, you know, uh, Danilo McDowell McCallum, um, Mia Sky Segarra, Paul Sakachan and all a bunch of the other people that were around us in the, in and around that time. Um, it just, yeah, it just, it felt like, a, it felt like a natural story to tell. Cause I know that, I know that story better than I know most stories. It's not something that I had to study um, or under, or understand in a way that was out, that was in my head. It, it's like, those, those are the stories, the memories of the places that we were and the people that we were at those times and who we are now, you know? And um, I mean, I saw both, I saw both Paul and Danilo two days ago, you know, like we're, we're connected, we're constantly connected. So, yeah. And so on that note, just so people, you know, I think I'm assuming folks will be watching this either before or after the film, they watch the film. So let's try to talk about things that will maybe give a little bit of sense of what the film what inspired it, what, what, what's at the heart of it. Yeah. And, you know, I know that it kind of came to you in a certain way, but, uh, you know, getting out of that way of, of, of all that, you know, exposition, like yeah. what, was at the, what was at the heart of what you, you were trying to tell and, 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 what kind of film were you, were you, did you set out to try to make and, and what kind of discoveries did you make and what is the film, what, what is the film saying for you now that it's done? Um, I don't, I don't exactly, I don't exactly know what it's saying, mm -hmm. um, but 
Um, so I, I got asked by Rosina Kazi, who was curating a, a program for Luminato to do a film that had to do with venues and venue closures. And what I told Rose is that I have a complicated relationship with some of those venues that are both open and have closed during the pandemic because we have great memories in those venues. All of us, we did hip hop music, we did spoken word. We were in those places in freestyle sessions, watching other people's shows, watching, you know, FOS, Socrates, uh, Julie Black, Tara Chase, whatever. We were, you know, watching the people that were just a couple years older than us and also engaging with those spaces ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I have beautiful memories in those places in like, you know, mid nineties kind of like hip hop um, community but also a lot of those venues did not treat us very well. Um, and so eventually Rose was like, you know what, just kind of like do whatever you want to do. And as soon as she said that, I was like, okay, what is a venue? What is a venue? A venue is just a place where something happens. It doesn't need to be like a concert hall or a, 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 an official music venue. And the places where I have the the most, the, the strongest memories and the deepest memories are like in my boy's basement or in the front steps of Oakwood Collegiate, where we, that was, that was the black entrance of Oakwood Collegiate. Everyone, anyone that went to Oakwood in and around that whole time knows what entrance that is at Oakwood Collegiate. Oakwood is a high school in Toronto um, that we all went to. Um, it was those places, it was alleyways, it was street corners, it was benches, it was all of those places because we all, as I said in the film, we all live with our mothers in two bedroom apartments. This is the apartment I grew up in. And so if you wanted, to, when you got to that age, 14, 15, 16, and you wanted to go out into the world, uh, you wanted to be with your friends, you wanted to experience things together. You didn't necessarily wanna be like up under your mom the whole time. Mm. You didn't have a basement or an attic or a backyard. You had to go out. And for young black people, or people of color, uh, we, we went out without those things, basements, et cetera, and we had to go out into the city. And where were we? There, was, there were places where we couldn't, we didn't have the money to like go have a nice dinner in a restaurant. We were too young to actually get into a bunch of the events that were happening, but we were in this high school, but you're not gonna sit in a classroom. Like mm. you were in all these in-between spaces, places that are meant to be thoroughfares stairways, alleyways, street corners. They're not places where you're meant to like stay, certainly not in a North American context. That's right. in, in more of a Caribbean context or a community context, that's where people interact with each other. That's, you know, I remember like the front, the front area of 118 Tyndall Avenue where my parents used to live when I was first born. Mm -hmm. And just the Caribbean community that stood out in front of that building and just hung out and talked and that kind of thing. And so I wanted to, I wanted to make a film that put some value on those in between spaces and all of the memories and the important things that happened in these places, which in other circumstances would just be a place that you walk by, you know? Yeah. And it's amazing. I mean, the line in, 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 in your film about you want to stay inside of 14. Like, you know, like when you, when I, the second I heard that line and all the spaces that you were are so familiar to me mm. and it's like, and, but you have only certain places that you, we were, you know, in that sort of colonial, you know, <laughs> structure that we exist in of like, you know, controlling our mobility of where we can go and where we can't, but then we finding like, the beauty and in the grit and these these nooks and these spaces within our city that are definitely overlooked and not seen which is something that has been a theme in the films that i i try to take because you know growing up in this city and what certain locations i would say more than a venue to load these locations these spaces that we we have to find and make our own that 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 are that are incredible and and um, and 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 really distinguishable about about where we live. Yeah. And you know, growing up and always seeing you know Toronto, whatever, or spaces kind of flipped and you know 
told they were in New York and Chicago and all these other places, but those who reside here and like yourself and your homies and your friends and all these spaces that we know about that yeah. are sacred to us. And I think that, you know, in such a simple, simple way of storytelling, you manage to evoke all of that with such little, you know, again, I'm using the word exposition, which we all get caught up in. You use zero <laughs> exposition. Yeah. And, and so for me, there's a craft to that storytelling that you've, you, you, you've developed. Yeah. And would you be able to talk about, you know, how, I mean, I know you love music and your music and, and, and language, but it's, as an artist, this is your first film, right? That you've kind of, what, what would you say that you've taken from, that you've learned from storytelling and those art forms you've, you've explored and what you've brought into the, the filmmaking space that, that you think yeah. maybe makes your film even more unique? Like it becomes your, unique perspective on how you're yeah. gonna make a film. I uh it's I think some of this was some of this was done kind of intuitively. I I spoke to uh someone, I can't even remember who it was now, but I was speaking to someone that was more in the music side of my life. And he was like, yeah, I was like a hook. You know, like mm -hmm. that line, like who wants to who wants to stay home at 14? It's a hook. Mm -hmm. Like it comes back multiple times like like mm -hmm. a pre-chorus, like a chorus. It's a hook. It's meant to, it's, it's like, you know, um, uh, when, when Frank Ocean says, we'll never be those kids again. Mm. It's very similar to that. It's something mm. that you feel like, you know the answer. You, you give the, you say that to people and anyone who has been 14, 13, you don't have to tell them the answer. <laughs> So in the, in the asking of the question, everybody knows the answer. Nobody wants to stay home at 14. You want to go out with your friends, right. right? And so it's kind of like, I didn't think about it like that, like it being a hook or it being like a bar, but it's a bar, mm. <laughs> it's mm. a bar, you know? And the best bars are things that resonate with people without any thought. They just hit people directly in the heart. And it, it relates to an experience that is a universal experience. Like kids all over the world don't want to stay home when they're 14. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know, but I don't, I, I, I disagree with you that there's no exposition, you know, because when I'm saying, if I say like, I, you know, I grew up here, here is the place. Downtown is the more specific like some of those things are trying to, we were, a, we were a short walk from the lake. Like all of those things actually are first acts, like exposition kind of things. I'm just not trying to, I'm trying to do it in a way where you, you're not supposed to notice that you're being oriented to the world, you know? Well, that's what I mean. It's like, when I say zero, I mean like, that's the craft of storytelling. Yeah. There's always, but how you hide it within the craft of the storytelling yeah. is where where it's not obvious. Yeah. You That's know what there is. You, you, you have to, and I, but I'm saying like the way you set it up and, 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 and the emotional resonance that I think, and you seeing like, you know, this line being this bar, or for me, it's like, you know, when I'm making films, I'm looking for, you know, these things that connect yeah. and that actually have to come back in, in the act yeah. that anchor people in the, in the thematic or the story or whatever. Yeah. And when you use the, 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 the way that music works, like is in the bar or like a chorus or something. Yeah. And I think that that is what I felt yeah. in the structure of, of cinema making, but I'm not thinking of it as a song. Do you know what I mean? I feel like- It's a you, song. You, it's a song. It's a song. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Actually. It's a song. It's and a I song. think that cinema is that, yeah. right? Like for me, and it's, and how you ride that. And, and I think that that is something where, where it makes your film, it sets it apart to, for me. Yeah. It, 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 so it, yeah. I had a, I, I went out for dinner with, uh, with Paul um, a couple of weeks ago uh, after this thing we did at the theater center, mm. his partner. And 
we sat at the table at, you know, I don't know what it was, midnight, 11 o'clock, camera, doesn't matter. And he said this, he said something that I've repeated several times just since then. He said, there's nothing like music. There is. There's nothing like music. Music is a yeah. weird, intangible thing. And for people that have engaged with music as, as deep listeners or as people who are deeply involved in it, or people that are makers of music, <clears throat> and all makers of music are listeners, that people who have done that, they never, they never get rid of it. And so I've made multiple things. I've done workshops. I've done, you know, now this film, I've done a couple of different things. I've made curriculum. And I, I always frame it like, this is a song because there's something about music that resonates with people that is beyond the intellect. And I get annoyed if I go to like a film thing or whatever, and there's this beautiful story about you know, whatever the character is, often it's documentary stuff that impacts me the most because I know that it's real people, especially expressive documentary. Mm. And, and then at the end, if the filmmaker is there, people stand up and they ask questions about the editing or mm. the color correction or mm. the kind of lens that they use. And I'm like, you guys are missing the point. Like those are, those are tools you, you need to understand those tools and how to use them and whatever, whatever. But those tools are, they're only important if the, if the, if the story connects with people. And I think right. music does that despite all of the, how, how complex and structured music actually can be. Music does that just by playing. That's you right. know, like it, it me and it, and it immediately does that. It has, it is the most, I think, immediate art form, like um, that affects you, that that propels you into memory, nostalgia, future, inspiration. You Absolutely. know, thinking thinking you're like ten feet tall, like breaking you down into like your, you know, you know your your trauma. Like, you know, it it immediately does that, and I think that that is what you your music in itself and I would love anybody who's checking this out and sees your film that they actually look you up and 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 explore your music because your music is something that that I think has 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 is has always been very powerful and, and it's always been um rooted in storytelling and has been rooted in in something that is very very I don't know honest so it's been very cool to see your your evolution as an artist uh, within the mediums that that I see clear connections to. Yeah. Um, you know, the reason why I wanted to pair this with Aquila is also because, you know, I felt like thematically there's this story about, you know, these these young men that grow up in the in the urban center and, mm -hmm. you know, the things and our, our the camaraderie we build and the the different, you know, different areas we explore that that can lead us down one path or this path or whatever and and how how that is actually a very is the line is so so fine yeah for us in that respect um so so i felt like that that was something that was that thematically had you know real power for me and also the fact that also you know, young Aquila is actually 14 in the film. Yeah. And so he's young Shepard, he's 14 in the film. Yeah. And you see these two young boys, like, like they're rarely inside throughout the whole film. Yeah. They're always outside and through the night and like, you know, um, under these different circumstances. But it, so it, it, it felt to me that there's this thing that we've grown up that we understand culturally that we could be outside at this time where we feel safe yeah but there are those times that we're outside that don't feel safe and we're out late like you know yeah. um so i so i, I want to talk about like you know how your relationship with, with with even who you feature in the film how you guys kept your kept each other in check yeah in these sort of spaces that 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 come to us and or not or like what what was that relationship like as if you can think back to your your 14 year old selves and like 
what that was like for you and and um because you all end up having like this artistic sort of synergy right like mm. you know into like manhood but what was that what was that um, think of the layer of your film connected to that and then think of these boys in my film but what was it about your crew and you guys that like would say sustained your relationship and sustained you in a certain way I mean, I, I feel like we all came together because of music and hip hop specifically. Mm. I used to tell people like I view hip hop as a, I, at the time I viewed hip hop like a sport. I didn't view it like it was a, like a, I'm not saying I didn't believe it was a form of music I did, but in terms of my interaction with it, I didn't view it like I wanna be this artist. I viewed it like a sport, like you go play basketball with your friends. Mm. It doesn't mean you necessarily wanna be in the NBA. It's just, this is what we do together for fun. Right. You know what I mean? And so I kind of viewed it like that. I, I think it's important to say that it's it, it totally depends on your relationship, like with the world, I suppose, that um, sure. I, I've, you know, a, a, a number of people have seen the film and us and some women have said we didn't have that experience. Mm. I, actually, we we they wouldn't they wouldn't let us out the house at 14. You know, so I do think it's a particular kind of like a young men's experience because the society holds women away from those things sometimes, depending on your family, depending on their relationship, depending on where you live, depending on all that kind of stuff. It's actually not the same relationship across the board that that we experienced. Um, yeah, but our our connection was based in music and hip hop. And then largely, I always, you know, I, I, when every time I talk about Danilo, I was like, how, like, people ask me how I got to know Danilo. I probably met Danilo when I was like 13, about to turn 14 in that, you know, you know, behind the, uh, in the field behind Oakwood Collegiate. He, he saved me from getting into a fight. I shouldn't be fighting. And, um, but he was one of the only people that if I said, let's go to the art gallery, as like two 15 year old black boys, he'd be like, let's go to the art gallery. Mm. You know what I mean? So, mm. and you know, Mia Sky is a, a visual artist, a poet. Uh, she lived in PO, which is like sometimes a beefing neighborhood with Esplanade still. Mm. Um, you know, and she had a very different life than me. You know, her mother is like, I can't remember, fifth generation Japanese Canadian, um, you know, but 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 grew up in PO surrounded by all kinds of different people. Uh, she definitely had a different experience than I did. But our our bond, like all of us, you know, Paul did music, I did music, Danilo did music at the time. Me and Danilo both drew, were interested in graffiti art. That's why we ended up under that you know, the Broadview Viaduct, like that was a well-known place where you would go see the new pieces, similar to Queen Alley's, it would just kind of turn into a tourist trap now. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Or, uh, I, I won't go into all of that, but yeah, I mean, we, we were just, we, we, we wanted to do the same things. We were interested in the same things. We wanted to write together. We wanted to draw together. We wanted to go see what other people were doing in the city. We wanted to go see you know, if FOS was starting to perform at Fresh Arts before those records came out, we were we were proud of what was happening in the city. We were the people that went and got the white labels at at Play the Record at you know yeah. when they were still on Young Street. You know, that's who we were. We were we were interested. I still have all those records like sitting there. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. we were those kids that were like interested in that, and we're going to, you know, if Rocksteady came or if the Roots came or if whoever came, we were the kids that were going to go and like try to figure out sometimes how to get in if we couldn't. And we would be at the freestyle sessions. We would be at Comfort Zone, which is gone now. We would be at Big Bop, which is gone now. We would be at like some of these places um, engaging with that, that culture. And so, and, and we consistently up until now are still interested in a wider array of those things, but still very similar things. And so I, I know that if you know, I mean, Danilo is curating for the city now. So he did the mm. Toronto sign, you know? So we're we're always kind of bouncing back and forth. Like, what are you doing these days? Sometimes I just don't, I don't know, even know what he's doing, but, right. you know? So I just, I wanted to, I wanted to tell a story about what I thought other people could relate to, you know, like 
a lot of people have had those experiences growing up in Toronto. This is my particular group of friends, but I know people have that same experience and it's not normally told when the, when the CN Tower is shot, it's usually shot from across the lake and you see the skyline and whatever, whatever. It's not necessarily shot from like in between where the Don Valley and the QEW hits like that's, but that's where we were. We weren't on the, in the Toronto islands, looking at that beautiful, pristine it's thing. Our, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a point of view, right? It's exactly. It's, it was and, and, and that's so, and that's what's so critical is what I'm saying is like what you're able to do in this beautiful piece is that, that like the point of view is so strong. The storytelling is so strong. The hook, the, the thematic is so strong. The, the visual consistency, the stylistic choices and the music, the composition and all these sort of elements that you, that makes cinema, make it is because it's like sound is 50% of your storytelling. And I consider music sound and, and how you're able to craft it. Um, I, I do want to get a sense of, of what you're thinking moving forward off of this experience. Um, you know, are there films that you're, you're thinking about making, um, exploring? Um, what, what's going on on that side for you? I just, I just want to be like you, Charlie. <laughs> ah, don't do it. No, yeah. um, no, man. Dethrone, dethrone, man. You, I you, mean, you, 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 yeah, go ahead. I want to be an artist. I, I've never really been able to full time just go into being an artist. I want to be an artist. I've never, I've never really considered myself to be any particular thing. Even I know people knew me from music and spoken word and all that kind of stuff. I was interested in film the entire time. I just didn't necessarily have the, the resources or the support to be able to do it. I'm, I'm doing this performance project, a live arts multimedia thing with the theater center, which involves film and performance and live music with a composer and sound designer, lighting designer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I did a book project for my father. I'm working on a book project for myself. I'm, I did a Kickstarter years ago to do another album, pro literally years ago to do another album project. I've been struggling to find my voice in music again. Um, but I just, I like, if in my ultimate, in my ultimate vision of like myself, I could just sit down and make things all day and make sure that they went out into the world. I'm predominantly interested in people, in people's like real core stories, um, on like the honesty or the, the thing, the places where people don't, the, the places where people feel uncomfortable communicating, but we all experience. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I'm most interested in, you know, like the stories that are not necessarily like the, the mainstream stories, but are mainstream in many ways because we sh we share a lot of these stories. Who wants to stay home at fourteen? I feel like it doesn't matter, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation. Like probably you had a feeling like that when you were around that time. And I think telling those stories through the lens of of very particular kinds of people and very particular kinds of stories, those are the things that I appreciate the most and I like operating on the edge of my ability, meaning I like doing things that I have difficulty doing that I'm still learning about. Yeah. So when this opportunity came, I was like, I'm not sure if I can do that, but I'm really interested. So I'll let, let me figure it out. That's that's what I want to do. I want to I want to continue to be an artist in all of its forms. Period. I love it. And I want to continue the next sentence after that period to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. I am inspired by you, always have been. Um, and this is a run-on sentence. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that um, I'm here for you if you would like to pursue more cinematic work. Um, you know, I really think that you are a unique voice that I'm excited about and um and really really want you to you know my hope for you is that you you do you know really really give some thought as to you know what that engine of cinema in this form where you want to go next with it not in terms of like you're not this person i don't have to warrant say this about you because you're you come from uh, a place of real intention is that you know 
all these stories that you've collected that are sitting in front of you that are around you and um i would love to see you dramatize a moment yeah. and i would love to do see you do something work on a little script together short piece um and uh and exercise your muscles there because i think there's something to translate out of the reality but um ian bless you brother it's uh, amazing to connect with you uh thank you kirk cooper and all those who organized this this uh this uh moment that that and the space for us to have this conversation again i hope that um anyone watching will will check out uh we went out it is uh, a beautiful piece of of, of cinema and check out Ian Kamau's music. And uh, and if you would like also, you know, throw and check in our Akilah's escape. <laughs> but prioritize those two things first. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, a question, a question that I have for you is how do you think the experience of personal trauma and what they would call vicarious trauma, watching, watching the traumas from people maybe that look like you or that have some relationship to you. How do you think that that affects people or the characters in your film mm. long-term and how do they express, how do they, how do you think uh, they express that impact? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, I think that the whole, you know, there was a theme of Achilles Escape that, what, that, is, that is also rooted in, in generational trauma. And, 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 and the characters have all experienced their personal trauma while, and they're actually watching it. And I think that the thematic was what happens when a man has, grown to be able to see, understand the trauma he's experienced personally, and then witnesses it happening to a youth. Yeah. And what is his place in that? Does he stand by and watch it happen? Or does he actually take action? Does he, and does he have to know this child? Does it have to be a family member? Yeah. Where do we do that as men, as black men, when we actually go through that space, if we do, um, of trying to, to unpack that for ourselves and find another space in our lives? And then when it presents itself, do we fight or flight? Is it fight or flight? And, and that, is, that was the dilemma, the core dilemma for Akilah that I tried to, um, you know, render, you know, by showing also his, his history as a, as a child, as a youth and, and what he was experiencing. And then, and then, you know, and then he as a man meets a kid that was exactly the same age when he was trying to navigate the trauma that was around him. And, and, um, and, and so I feel like that was more than exploring the, the generational, you know, sort of politics of violence that comes as connected to the, all these other things. I was really looking at, you know, us as black men and us as boys. When are, when are we as boys stripped from that space? Um, you know, where, where, where we don't get to just be boys, you know, um, because of this trauma and because you're, you, you know, you're trying to figure it out and, and you don't really have much guidance. Yeah. You know, you're left to kind of find things on your own. Um, so, so that was really a strong point. And, and from our, you know, current position, it's something that, you know, I've dealt with, you, I'm sure you deal with when we see these things that happen, you know, we feel them, you know, in our, in our, cellularly like in our bones and, and molecularly and we feel these things and they're happening in another country they're yeah. happening in another place yeah. um because it's i think it's it's, it's ancestral and, it's, and we're all connected in a certain way we understand this these things and we also the 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 fear and the and the reality that that i think we see ourselves so clearly that 
that could be me. Nothing exempts me from this happening to me. And to understand that authentically as we exist in our skin and our bodies, we feel it. <laughs> yeah. I have, a, I have a follow up question. How, how do you think that affects you, you, Charles Officer, as, mm -hmm. as an individual, but also as a new father? Wow. Yeah. Oof. I mean, it's, I've been learning with how it's affected me, especially how things have accumulated over the last couple of years. Um, I mean, I had to really try, be, I had to, and never had to be more conscious of taking space for myself um, because of the things that were coming up. And, 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 and also, you know, the patience, you know, I, I consider myself a fairly, fairly patient person, but I was losing such patience with, with some of the conversations and some of the questions and some of the, the space that, that, and, you know, that has been foreign to other individuals. And so finding the frustration in that personally, I, I really had to, you know, um, navigate and, and really make choices. You know, when people are inviting me to things and I'm saying, no, it's not for me right now. And then they're coming at me like, as if I am failing somebody. Yeah. If I'm failing them, and these ain't even black people inviting me to events, yeah, yeah. and I'm, yeah. I'm like, and, I, and I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> what is happening here? You know, even uh, like my own um, health that I and what I need is 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 being overlooked by what you need right yeah. now. Um, as a new father, it's been. Uh, the most terrifying Scorpio space in my mind that I can go to and often pops up when I see this, this, this new being who has no clue, completely, I mean, maybe in their bone, bones, DNA, there's something going on, but there's nothing that, that is concrete that they know what, what, what they will encounter yeah. in this world um, just by birth, right? And, and that to me is, has made me already, I've gotten really like the internal monologue. Sometimes I can't even say repeat some things knowing that, you know, the little guy got sick for the first time and the things that I was going through of like, who got him sick, you know, was, was like elevated, like so high. And I know it's going to happen many times, but it was so hardcore. And I'm thinking about these other massive life or death scenarios that again, you know, I'm praying, but I'm aware that it can, that anything can happen. Yeah. So it's, it's made, it's really kind of built a certain protective, you know, um, uh, new bone in my body. But at the same time, I'm just really trying to, uh, you know, equip him already very early with what we're reading to him and how we're talking to him and the music we play and all the things. And, um, to build a certain sort of confidence in where he comes from and what he can stand by. And if anyone challenges that, he can stand by it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.